which leads me to one of my yeah, random quiz questions. We'll start by um, my late work policy. Several of you asked about my late work policy. Remember that you, if you do take quizzes, you, want, you get two points out of 10 usually is just for asking me a science question or a question about the class. Um, so several of you asked about late work policy. I do accept late work. It's usually 5% off for every day late it is. Um, I usually, unless it's a problem, unless it's a habitual thing for you, I usually stop that at 50% so that you, you know, you can turn something in. If you miss one assignment, you turn it in three weeks late, you can still get half credit for it. Um, that usually is enough to separate people who are usually on top of due dates. Uh, I'm not, I reserve the right to, if it gets really, really out of hand, say, I'm okay, this is the last late assignment I'm going to, I'm going to accept from you or you will only have one week to turn in your late work if, if it's particular to your um, your case. I've never had to do that, um, so please don't make me have to do that. Uh, but in general, yes, I do accept late work. Um, just get it in as quickly as you can. Uh, quizzes and tests, when we have complex problems like the black hole problem on a test, no, never on the in-class test. On take-home tests, sure. Um, usually the way that test my tests are laid out is about two thirds of the points will be in class skills stuff. Z conversions, like length to length conversions, geometry, can you do basic stoichiometry? Can you count the number of protons in an, out, in an atom if I tell you what element it is? So easy skills that you should be able to do like the back of your hand. So any test tanking anxiety should be less of a factor. And then any, any problem solving stuff where you, other than, sorry, there's one out of the 10 questions. So 10% uh, of the in-class test um, will be asking you to think on your feet a little bit. It'll be kind of a, a trickier problem, but nothing approaching level as the black hole problem or the copper and lead spheres. Those are, um, at, if I gave those to you on a test, it would be on the take home part of the test. It's more like my car gets this gas mileage. Um, if I have, you know, 30 liters of gasoline, can I make it from here to Sacramento? Um, and you have to, you know, just show your work and do it. It's more like just a basic word problem rather than a really tricky one. Yeah. I, yeah, we're still getting in the, getting used to each other and I'm getting used to whether or not I should have even made those practice problems from last Tuesday in assignment or if I should have just made them on your own um, so that you can decide whether you understand it well enough or not. I did make an assignment. I put a due date of Friday, but if you got it turned in this weekend or even for this, for these first two assignments, really any time this week, get it turned into me on paper or even better, it's on Canvas. Um, and, and I'm not going to be too harsh on that. Gwen? Check again, because I think I fixed that. If, it, if it's still not fixed, remind me after class and I'll fix that, okay? Yeah. Only one of them had a submit. Okay. I the the second set of practice problems, one that you did last Tuesday, I just made that the assignment that you could turn it in last Wednesday. So if you finished it and tried to turn it in on Tuesday, there was nowhere to do that. Like I said, I'm re I had to restructure everything because this I'm used to doing this as a 12 week class where I meet with with y'all a lot less frequently. So I'm still adjusting things too. So be patient with me, and I'll be patient with you when it comes to stuff like that. Um. Any other qu questions about Canvas or late work? Um, I have several questions on retakes and or extra credit. I don't usually do either of those. Although I will say that if I have a need to curve a test, which I usually only do if the class average dips below about 75. If the class average is below 75 on a test, um, then usually what I'll do is we'll do a you get your test back correct it, turn it back in, and you'll get a third of the points that you missed. Um, so it's not usually enough to take you from a from a D to an A. It's not that kind of a retake, but it's enough to take you from a, a D to a mid to high C. Um, but like I said, that's usually only if I totally misjudge what y'all are capable of um, and give you a test that's way too hard or everybody in here misjudges how much to study and 
um, bombs the test. Have, haven't had to do that in, it's probably been about four years since I've had a test, since I wrote a test there that, that was that surprising to my students. Um, so shouldn't be an issue, but that also means you only get one try, no reduce. So be ready for it the first time. Um, and again, a week before the test, I think what, what we'll do for a midterm, we'll do midterm, quick show of hands. Would you guys rather take a midterm the week before Thanksgiving or the week after Thanksgiving? Before, then probably well, I'll set that up. It'll probably be the Friday before Thanksgiving. Um, and a week before that, I will give you last year's midterm. Um, so you will have exactly what the structure looks like, exactly what to study. Um, so, and that'll be your homework for that week will be do the practice test, take last year's test um, so that you're ready to come in and take the test the following Friday. So usually class averages are pretty high. They're in the mid, mid, uh, mid eighties, uh, mostly because there's no surprises. If you do your work, you prepare, ask me for help, check against the key. Um, everybody does fine on my tests, right? Anything else? All right. Any other course stuff? Okay. Then we'll do some relevant questions and then some random questions to get everybody back into thinking about random stuff. Um, and then we'll get into some new material. Now, somebody asked, I used the phrase infinite sig figs at one point on Friday. Somebody asked, what did you mean by that? Well, I, I just mean that when you have, if you have an exact number, there's no way that you could be off any amount, right? So not only could you not, if I was counting the number of students at this first bench here, it's one, two, three, right? And it's not about three. It's not 3.001. There is zero uncertainty associated with that number. I could see three discrete objects. I can count them, which means, and if there's absolutely no uncertainty, if you were actually writing it as a decimal, you would actually have to write 0. 0.00000 out to infinity, right? Because the last digit that we report on a measured number is where the uncertainty is. If there is no uncertainty, there is no last digit we would write. We would keep going 0, 0, 0, et cetera, all the way out to infinity. So when it comes to rounding rules, that's why I say that's infinite sig figs. Because if you have an exact number as a conversion factor or anywhere in a calculation, it's never going to limit your number of sig figs right? and, or rounding for addition and subtraction. Yeah. That's a good question. So I, I can't think of a problem that I would write that would ask you to do that, to take a, a whole number an exact whole number and um, wind up with a partial number from it. Um, so that would be, it, that's probably a case of you would have to use some judgment or ask me, but if you're using your judgment, if I say a third of 10 people, then it can't be three, three and a third people. So it's gotta be three people, right? And you would just say, well, I had to round to the closest whole number because it's an, a discrete number of objects. And you would just explain that in your in your work. Um, and then the second question has kind of two answers. How do you know the precision or uncertainty of a measurement? That depends on if you're the one measuring or not. If you're reading somebody else's measurement, how do you know where the uncertainty is? If I wrote 3.21 miles, Where's the uncertainty? In the last spot, in the last reported digit is where the uncertainty is. So we would say that this measurement has a precision of 0.01. And actually to make this more clear, let's say it's 3.23. The It has a precision of 0.01 and the uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.01. Right. Technically, this writing out the uncertainty, you never need to do that if somebody knows our rules, right? Which is why we have our standard rules for rounding and sig figs. Um, it's never wrong to have this written. 
though. It just, it's just a way of reminding yourself what the uncertainty is. And you can always, any measured number, you can always write plus or minus 0 0.01 or plus or minus wherever, whatever the last reported digit is. And then, so if you measured it like that with that many, with that much uncertainty and you converted it to like kilometers, would you have to convert the 0.01 to kilometers? So that is one way you can do it. Our rules for keeping the right number of sig figs when we do conversions takes that into account for us. Because usually we don't want to have to do, one, we don't want to have to do two separate conversions. Um, but two, if we follow our rules carefully, keeping the right number of sig figs when we round at the end, um, that does that conversion for us. On the second homework, it like asked the uncertainty if it was like, if it was like uncertainty the first part and then like convert it, that you can then if it's explicitly stated like that, you can do it that way. Typically what you would do is you would just, by keeping the right number of digits means you don't need to worry about writing it explicitly or converting it explicitly. All right, so if we went through the process of going, we'll use the shortcut, the um, 3.23 miles. We're trying to put that in kilometers. Um, you can go the long road. If you wanted to use all exact conversions, and I will have you do this on one of the tests, I will make you go miles to kilometers using only exact conversions, um, which means you've got to go miles down to feet, down to inches, over to centimeters, because your only exact conversion from metric to, um, to imperial units is centimeters to inches. So you would have to take miles, convert it down to inches, inches to centimeters, and then centimeters back to kilometers. That's the only exact way to do it. The shortcut way though, if you only need four sig figs, there is one on your conversion sheet, that's an approximate conversion that goes to four sig figs. Because it's approximate, that means that this could also limit how many sig figs we get to keep. That's what the difference between exact and, and measured when it comes to conversion factors, right? So when we did this, if we do this, we're going to keep three sig figs at the end. Where's the calculator out? What's uh? Give me an answer there. It's going to be what, like uh, right around five, just over five, five kilometers is three point one miles. If you're used to running five k's, five point one nine. Give me one more sig fig. Three, four, four. four. Okay. The fact that we're going to round it to three sig figs because we only have three sig figs in our initial measurement. So we just round it down 5.19. That's also assumed to be plus or minus 0.01 kilometers, right? So that's why we are careful with our rounding rules is because if we do so, we don't need to worry about rounding that or uh, converting that as well. All right. Anything else on uncertainty or conversions? Any other quiz questions or about the stuff on the quiz? Will you, will you like pick up one, two, three, like plus or minus? So, tip, so in terms of point deductions, I usually, if I, unless I'm specifically testing you on sig figs, a sig fig error is usually minus a quarter of a point. Um, Enough that if you f ignore sig figs for the entire test, it might be enough to bump you down, you know, five or six percentage points, enough to take you from an A to a B maybe, um, but not enough that you really need to worry about it that much. As long, if you, as long as you're close and you're doing your best, it's really not gonna make that big of a difference in your grade. All right, I want you, I want you paying attention to it, but I don't want you getting hung up on it, if that makes sense. All right, anything else about course material, material yet? All right, this is mostly the only time that I do answer personal questions from the quiz questions, but since I did say ask me anything this time, there were some random personal questions and some random science questions. We'll talk about some of them. Um, I told you guys, first day, that this is the first question I always get when I say I teach chemistry. Why would you teach chemistry? Um, and Mostly for me, it was actually a way to not make a decision because I figured if I could teach chemistry or if I, um, if you study chemistry, you can study any science really. Chemistry is close enough to physics. You can go from chemistry to physics and it, it's close enough 
um, to biology. You can go from go to biology. You can go to geology from chemistry. I didn't really want to make a decision because I liked studying everything in high school. Um, so I picked chemistry and then wound up staying chemistry. Um, and what advice for anybody looking to go into chemistry or going into academia? Uh, get used to being confused, um, but don't be satisfied being confused. I remember being in high school and the first time I saw, I heard something that was enough, I got it. If you're decent at math, it usually doesn't take that much at the high school level to be able to do pretty well in math classes, right? Or in science classes, there's some studying, but for the most part, it's your idea of studying is going to change when you get to college. Um, I remember, like I said, I, I did not study very much in high school. Um, and when I got to college, my second or third year, it would go I would spend three hours reading 10 pages of a textbook and still not understand it and have to go and reread it and that take another two hours the next day to reread it. I'd get a little bit more each time I did that, but you got to be used to the fact that it's going to take hard work to understand stuff. Otherwise, why bother going to college, right? If it's just more memorizing, um, like some of the, some of the classes that you have in high school, then why bother going to college if you can just use the internet? Um, it's because you're learning how to learn really abstract, weird concepts. Um, and so you're going to be confused the first time you see some of these things. And the second time you see some of these things, and maybe the third time you see some of these things. Um, but so get used to that. But at the same time, keep pushing yourself to get to the point where it makes sense eventually. Um, that and be willing to change your ideas about what you want to do as you get there. You never know what opportunities are going to come up, um, what interests are going to change. I thought I wanted to study biochemistry, and then I actually studied biochemistry, and I said, this is awful. Um, and so I went to physical chemistry, which is like the opposite end of chemistry. And that was awful, too, when it comes to research. So what I really figured out is I don't like research. Um, but, you know, be willing to learn about yourself. And, and when somebody offers you a good opportunity, try it out, even if it's not exactly what you thought you were going to be doing. Um, Along with that, somebody said, what was I like in high school? I played a lot of weird sports because I wasn't tall enough or big enough to play like football um, or soccer or uh, anything like that. So I played water polo because I could make the varsity team just by working hard and being willing to, you know, I won't say play dirty, but um, being being rough um, was all it really took. And being able to swim a little bit was enough to make varsity. Um, so I played like water polo, I did wrestling, I did play swimming in college, I played rugby. Um, basically all the sports where there's less competition so that I could actually get in there and, and play. Uh, and then my friends and I took a lot of honors classes and, and studied a little bit, but mostly we screwed around at my friend's farm because he had a bunch of welding equipment. So we all took welding class when we were freshmen and then we built stuff in his yard. We built a, a trebuchet out of tractor parts and um, fence posts one year that worked pretty well until it broke and nearly nearly destroyed my friend's face. Um, it was really not very smart in retrospect, but it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot about physics and engineering. <laughs> um, and that goes along with some of my favorite memories. Although the one story I'll tell you um, was actually in college. I was a back sitter in organic, in classes in general. I always sat in the back. Um, my friends and I kind of were the ones that didn't really pay attention very much. Um, and my current, my wife now, um, obviously wasn't then, uh, she was late for organic chemistry because she thought it was in a different room. And when she got there, she was a front sitter, but the only seat left was next to me and my friends at the back. So she got sit stuck sitting next to me and my roommates. Um, and we started dating a couple months later. And, and so I met my wife in organic chemistry because she was late to class. Um, so that was one of my favorite memories. I, I know, right? <laughs> so pay attention, show up to class, even if it's late. All right, random science questions, and then we're getting, getting in, into energy some more. If Earth developed the technology to travel in galaxies and you had the opportunity to go along for the ride, which gal galaxy would I pick? Heck, I'd settle for a different solar system, let alone galaxy, um, or planet even at this point. But... I guess it would depend on how you were getting there. Is this, we're talking like a generation ship thing where, you know, it's going to take us 500 years to get there and I will never see the end of the journey. Or is this a, like you step across, a, you know, through a portal and you're instantly there. I, 
what do we know about the other situation? You know, what's going on? Um, but I think it's, it's kind of cool and it kind of gets into, I love sci-fi because it talks about like, oh, well, what would it look like if it took 300 years to get to Alpha Centauri? How could you de design a spaceship that could actually get humans there, even if it's not the same humans that left? Um, so ideas like that and thinking about stuff like that's always a lot of fun to me. And along with that, space and black holes. Black holes are really cool. You guys were thinking about black holes because I gave you that problem about black holes. Um, black holes are also called singularities, which if you've taken, taken math, a singularity is the same thing as an asymptote, basically, except it's an asymptote in real, real space. It's basically where the gravity is so intense that even light can't escape. Right, that's what makes it a black hole. And so really not even information can travel past the barrier or what they call the event horizon of a black hole. Um, and so stuff behaves really, really weird, um, which is kind of cool. Most of what I know about black holes is from reading Stephen Hawking's books, um, which is also how I'll answer the next question. Um, Stephen Hawking says it's possible technically to make a time machine. And Stephen Hawking says it's technically possible then I'll go with that since he's the expert. Um, but here's an interesting thing he did say about that is you would only ever be able to travel back to the point where the first time machine was turned on because t making a time machine requires warping the fabric of space time in such a way that um, if it hasn't happened yet, you can't get past that initial point when it was first turned on, which is kind of interesting to think about. So it's possible that there could be time time travel, but not yet. And if we do, there's a theoretical limit on it. And a guy smart enough that like Stephen Hawking says that then, and he presented the math in a fairly convincing way for me, not as a physicist to be able to follow it. And so I thought that was a good question too. If you're interested in which Stephen Hawking book to read, because there's a lot of good ones, talk to me afterwards, because it depends on what you're into, what's, uh, what I would recommend. All right, let's do some review. We ended talking about temperature, right? Let's talk about, or let's do some, some practice. Ethanol, um, AKA drinking alcohol, boils at 78 Celsius at sea level. What is that in Fahrenheit and what is that in Kelvin? <laughs> Equations are up at the top, get your paper out. Let's start filling this in. If you want practice, try and estimate that in your head before you do the math. Reminder, Kelvin's the easy one, right? Kelvin is the same as Celsius, it's just offset by 273.15. So if you have it in Celsius, all you have to do is add 273.15 and then round to the right spot, which unless I forgot to carry my one, I think you get 351 Kelvin. We only keep to the, the ones place, right? Because we were plus or minus one degree here. And all we did was add 273, right? So it means we're still gonna be plus or minus one because our rule for addition and subtraction is keep the same number of decimal places. So about Kelvin, it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. Um, Technically, degrees by definition means that you've divided something up into between zero and 100 or between zero and a set 
end point, like 360 degrees. So because Kelvin is not defined by starting at here's zero, here's 100, and I'm going to make the markings in between, we don't write degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. Fahrenheit's the annoying one, right? 1.8 times 78. If you really want to be care taking care of your units, that's um, that 1.8 is a slope. So it actually has units. So it's degrees Fahrenheit per degree Celsius times 78 degrees Celsius. For temperature, I don't usually worry about the units as long as you know which equation you're you're using because doing algebra with units makes things look weird. Makes you think that something has significance when it doesn't necessarily. One point eight times seventy eight is what? Sorry, one hundred and forty point four. <laughs> Excuse me. How many sig figs are we going to keep? Two. Not because of the 1.8. That's infinite sig figs. That's exact. But because the 78 is two sig figs. So it's 140 plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Which seems weird, right? Seems like we lost a lot of precision by doing this conversion. 140.4 Fahrenheit, but we're not gonna keep that. Once we're going to keep it to plus or minus 10. So it's 140 or 1.4 times 10 to the two plus 32. You have to do your rounding every time you switch operations. When you go from as if you're doing something that's all multiplication and division, I don't care if you round every step or you round at the very end. It's probably better to round at the very end. Um, and if you're doing something that's all addition and subtraction, round at the very end. But if you have to switch operations and all of a sudden our rules change before we can switch rules, we have to do our rounding, which is why this is such an annoying conversion to do. Um, and just like I told you once, I'm going to make you go the long way and do conversions that are really annoying just once on the test. I'll make you go kilometers to miles the long way. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to give you a conversion on the test that will be a mixture of addition and multiplication which it means basically I'm telling you, it's gonna be a temperature conversion where you have to pay attention to the sig figs because I'm specifically testing you on that. So our final answer here would be 170 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which means we can't really write it like this or we get what's called an ambiguous number. Did you guys talk about ambiguous numbers with with uh, Mr. Tomes. So an ambiguous number means that you can't tell by looking at it how many sig figs it has. Um, and they're really obnoxious because what are you supposed to do with that when it comes to your rounding? If I just write 170 Fahrenheit, move it up so everybody can see it. You don't know what the uncertainty is, right? That could be plus or minus one, that could be plus or minus 10 which makes it ambiguous. Ambiguous just means not well-defined or it's unclear. This is an ambiguous number, which is in itself a sig fig error. If you ever get an answer and after you do your rounding, it's an ambiguous number, it has to be in scientific notation or you have to write out the uncertainty. You could write 170 plus or minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit is an acceptable answer because now it's no longer ambiguous. It tells you where the uncertainty is. Or put it in scientific notation because in scientific notation, it makes it really obvious. If it was plus or minus one, it'd be 1.70, right? If it's plus or minus 10, it's just 1.7. 
So those are our two ways to make sure that you don't have an ambiguous number. I'm making a big deal about it now and it's an extra thing to remember, but it's still just the same like quarter point deduction if you write an ambiguous number. So it's not that big of a deal, um, but it's worth paying attention to, especially when you're doing labs because it's really annoying to get data from somebody else and then not have any idea how many sig figs are supposed to be on a number um, because they left it ambiguous. So worth paying attention to. Any questions on temperature? Yeah. They will be on your conversion sheet, which let me pull up the conversion sheet. I keep saying that, but I'm also unclear. Do you guys um, get a copy of it? Okay. Um, but just to make sure I will, Dropbox. Um, the, oh, that's me. Um, there might be some um, corrections to this, the version, the version that you have is the most um, recent version. All the equations are on there. You have to know what they mean. You have to know what the variables are. But if you know what the variables are, the equations are all on there. And temperature is down here at the bottom. And I gave you, even though we haven't defined a lot of these equations or used it, very many of them, they're on here so that you have the same piece of paper that you're used to looking to, looking at to do your conversions, to do any word problems, to do any equations. It's all on the same sheet. So when you get on the test, I'm going to give you a fresh copy so you, in case you wrote notes or whatever all over yours, um, but it's going to look just like you're used to seeing it. Again, no surprises. The theme of me writing tests is I don't want the test to dictate how well you do. I want the material to dictate how well you do and your, well, really your knowledge of the material. Right. So this is exactly what I'm going to give you on the test. So get used to using this. Use this as your go-to. Don't Google what's the conversion for something. Get used to using this so you know what you're practicing with your tools as well. If you like. All right. Any other questions on temperature or conversions in general? Reminder, Kelvin will never be negative. Zero Kelvin is the slowest possible speed that molecules can move. That's what makes it zero Kelvin. If you calculate Kelvin as negative, you did something wrong. So use that as a red flag, Derek. Uh, why is there Fahrenheit? Because they didn't define zero as the point at which all molecular motion ceases. They just picked a point like water melting or a mixture of salt and water um, and called that zero because it was pretty cold. Um, zero Kelvin, and there's actually an equivalent measure in there's absolute Fahrenheit as um, Kelvin is absolute Celsius, where all you have to do is add it to Celsius. Um, absolute Fahrenheit is called Rankine, uh, and engineers in the U.S. occasionally use it because if you're used to using Fahrenheit, but you need to use some of these other equations that involve absolute temperature, you might need something like that. But in general, in practical uh, world, Pretty much everybody, if you need to convert to absolute temperature, everybody goes to Kelvin. When is that negative so yeah, negative 173 is about, not, is minus 173 or minus what? Minus 300 Celsius? No, it's wrong. No, I mean like, what if it's like negative 300? Oh, you can't, you can't have anything that cold. So you measured something wrong. Okay. Or I gave you a number that doesn't make sense. If I ever give you a problem and you think you did your conversion to Celsius to Kelvin right, but you get a negative number, that means either you misread it or I gave you a bad number, which is both possible. So uh, feel free to check on that one. There's one other fun thing. Let's do one more Celsius to Fahrenheit. Let's do minus 40. Negative 40 Fahrenheit to Celsius.
So negative 72. And let's not worry about sig figs for just for this one. And you'll see why in a second. You get negative 72 equals 1.8 Celsius, right? What's negative 72 divided by 1.8? Negative 40. So negative 40 is where they intersect. Negative 40, you don't actually have to specify which if you're in Celsius or Fahrenheit because negative 40 Fahrenheit is negative 40 Celsius. There is one point, if you think about two lines intersecting, um, there is one point where they are the same, where they have the same X and Y value. That's negative 40. Um, I bring this up because once I thought, I thought that was pretty cool. So once I put that on a test um, and I got several people that, that gave up on the algebra because they thought they were doing something wrong because they kept getting the same answer out that they put in. Um, I thought like, oh, if they're going to notice. They're going to be like, oh, that's cool. And now in a testing circumstance, everybody's just like, my algebra is broken. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, so now you know that not on a testing situation. And you won't be surprised if you ever see that again. <laughs> All right, we're going to do a couple more vocab and classification type things we talked about. Um, we talked about matter and atoms um, the other day. And so we're gonna do some more conceptual stuff and then we'll get into some calculations with time. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I get Joel Edwards, please? I'm sure that's not the case. I'll see you in a few minutes. So. All right, back here, leave. Leave for Joel. All right, so let's talk about some more conceptual stuff. We talked about energy a little bit, kinetic versus potential. Um, let's talk a little bit about other types of matter. So we talked, we went, when we talked about um, atomic theory, we talked about Democritus cutting a piece of copper wire in, in smaller and smaller pieces, right? Um, and he said, okay, well, every atom is defined as being a specific element and all atoms of that element are the same. Well, that's true as long as we have a pure substance. So a pure substance means that, that, well, it's the, it, the atoms are always combined the same way. It's a pure substance. Um, and but even that gets a little hazy because phase change, how does phase change affect that? Is it, are they still really connected the same way if it's liquid copper versus solid copper? But basically, if all of the atoms are the same element, it's a pure substance. And so elements are the simplest form of pure substance because you only have one type of element. It's a box of, if you go back to our Lego analogy, it's a box of all the same yellow Lego, yellow two by two brick of Lego. They're all identical. Um, you can combine them in lots of different ways. You can make them different shapes, but at the end of the day, they're all the same piece. On the other hand, if we have multiple elements always combined in the same ratio, always combined the same way, then it's a compound, right? Compound literally means you mix things together. Um, so a compound is multiple elements, but always still in the same ratio. And if, and for the most part, that also means they're connected, the, the atoms are connected to each other the same way. So for instance, we go back to water versus hydrogen peroxide. They're two different compounds, even though they're both made of the same elements, because the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is different. So H2O versus H2O2 are two different compounds because our ratio of atoms is different. And it turns out we can actually get, um, it turns out we can actually get 
more specific because just looking at the ratio isn't always enough to, to tell us what um, compound it is. Uh, does anybody know what C6H12O6 is? Glucose. Well, it's also a lot of other things, though, because it turns out glucose and fructose and galactose all have the same formula if we just look at the ratio of atoms and elements. So there's a little bit more to, than just saying they're all in the same ratio. They also have to be connected the same way for it to be the same compound. Otherwise they're gonna be related compounds usually, but not necessarily all exactly the same. Um, the example I always use with my OCHEM class is uh, CH6O can be Drinking alcohol, can, or sorry, C2H6O, or it can be ether. Very, very different properties, very, very different uses, um, but the same exact ratio. So we'll get into what that means when we talk about types of bonds in the future. But in general, if it's a pure substance, that means that all of your atoms or all of your molecules have the same ratio and the atoms are connected the same way. Um, so you can have a pure substance that is more than one element, as long as all the molecules are identical and combined the same way. Right? So water is still a pure substance, even though it's not an element. It's a little bit hazy to define, right? Um, the main thing is, though, it's all of the molecules are identical. It's a pure substance. On the other hand, if you if you have more than one element and they're not all identical, you have a mixture. So basically, it's it's kind of a flow chart where you can answer a series of yes or no questions. Like question one: Are all of the atoms the same element? If you said yes, it's an element. If you said no, then the next question is: Are all of the pieces put together the same way? Are all the molecules identical to each other? If you say yes, that's a pure substance. If you say no, it's a mixture. And then we can further differentiate between types of mixtures as well. So mixtures typically, we're, we call them physically mixed, not chemically mixed. The elements are not attached to each other um, necessarily. They're just sort of in the same space. Um, and that means you can change the proportions as well. That's the trick. That's what defines a mixture versus a compound. I think I have a slide that shows this in a second. Let me double check. Oh, I left that one out today. Um, so if we have a system that is all H2O molecules. And they're all connected. They're all H2O. They're all floating around in a container with each other. That's a pure compound. On the other hand, if we had the same ratio, if we have a bunch of hydrogen gas floating around, let's see, we had, oh, let's add one more over here. We have hydrogen gas and oxygen gas floating around. We have the same number of atoms in both cases, right? Is this a pure compound or a pure substance? No, because there's nothing preventing me from adding another oxygen molecule. Right now, it's a two to one ratio, but I could add another oxygen molecule without changing the amount of hydrogen we have. Over here, if I added another molecule of H2O, I had two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? It has to be the same ratio every time I add another water molecule. If you can vary that ratio, that means it's a mixture. So for instance, if you're, if you're cooking pasta, you've got, and let's say that your tap water is pure water. Um, everybody knows when you cook pasta, you're supposed to salt the water, right? Makes your pasta taste good. Helps it cook faster at altitude too. Um, you always have the same exact amount of salt. 
And you just grab a handful, throw it in, right? The fact that it's not always the same amount, it's not one cup of water is by definition 15 grams of salt as well, has to be a mixture. The fact that that salt to water ratio can change means it's a mixture. And the other thing about mixtures is that usually it's relatively easy to separate the components. If I told you to separate the components of water, would any of you know how to do that? Not, not easily. You could probably look it up, right? The internet's wonderful, but it's not easy to separate these pieces. It's pretty easy to separate salt from water. How do you do that? Yeah, you drive all the water off. What's left over is the salt, right? Easy enough to separate and you still wind up with water and salt. Same things at the end as you started with. That's how you know it's a mixture if you can undo it and if you can change that ratio. Um, how many of you knew that brass was a mixture? Brass is a, is a metal, right? It's a metal alloy though, which means it's a mixture of other metals. If you take zinc and copper mixed together in the right ratio, you get brass. If you change that ratio, you get bronze. But there's different qualities of brass that are dependent on what that ratio is for different applications, right? So the fact that you can add a little bit more zinc without changing the amount of copper, change that ratio means it's a mixture. What's that? Can you, it gets a little bit trickier with metal alloys because you have to make them liquid again, but yeah, you can. If you, has anybody ever, um, left a, uh, a stainless steel pot on a, on a gas burner for too long. Uh, I got my, I did that once on accident. I had some water in it. The water evaporated when I wasn't paying attention. I came back and, uh, um, and what happens is you can actually heat up the steel to the point where the different components of the steel start to separate out because some of them melt at a lower temperature than others. And so you wind up with basically with spots where some of the, the stuff kind of migrates to the surface instead of being Wrong slide, wrong computer. Instead of being a homogeneous mixture, the way stainless steel pots are supposed to be, you get a heterogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous means unevenly mixed. Homogeneous means uniformly distributed. So my stainless steel pot is now a heterogeneous stainless steel pot. Um, it started as a homogeneous stainless steel pot. Right, and again, this gets a little bit tricky. There's some gray area because how evenly mixed are we talking? Is it like mostly evenly mixed? Is it mean like visibly evenly mixed? Or do, are we mean like perfectly evenly mixed? Um, so if you add oil to water, you get a mixture, but it's not a homogeneous mixture, right? Because you can still, you can visibly see like bubbles of oil, right? Inside the water, that's heterogeneous. Brass and copper, as long as you don't mess it up the way I messed up my stainless steel pot, we would normally think of as being homogenous. How about wet sand at the beach? Is that heterogeneous or homogenous? Probably consider that heterogeneous. If you got a scoop of water from the beach that was some sandy, um, you could probably pick out this, the sand, not by hand, but like, Visibly, you could look at it and see that's a grain of sand in there, right? So if you can visibly see a difference, it's homogenous. Or sorry, it's, I misspoke. If you can visibly see the difference, it's heterogeneous. Tea, on the other hand, is a good example of that gray area. Has anybody ever made tea with honey in it? It doesn't matter how well you stir it. There's always more honey at the bottom than at the top, right? It looks homogenous. It's mostly homogenous. But if you took a sample from the top and the bottom and you were really, really careful about analyzing it, the bottom's probably going to be sweeter than the top. That means that there is some wiggle room with these two terms. It means that this is one of those cases where on a test, if I said, is it heterogeneous or homogenous? I'm not looking for one right answer. I'm looking for you to justify what you say. If you say that T is homogenous because visibly it's the same at top and bottom, or it's roughly the same at top and bottom, or it's the same at top and bottom when it's freshly mixed, that's full credit. But if you said it's heterogeneous because 
the honey sinks to the bottom, I, that's a full credit answer too, as long as you can explain your logic. Right? Because there's a there's another another kind of trick question. Uh, it's not not on there. Um, milk. Is milk homogenous? Depends on what scale we're talking about. You can buy it at the grocery store. It says homogenized. What do you mean it's not homogenous? It says it on the label, homogenized. Well, that it's still not, if you zoom in enough, what makes milk milky, what makes it opaque, is the fact that there's little tiny droplets of fat and proteins floating around in it that scatter the light. For something to be really homogenous, it, it almost always will be transparent as well, at least as a liquid. Um, although with metals, that also gets wonky. Um, but in general, like it depends on what scale you're talking about. The last sip of milk out of a milk carton tastes the same as the first sip of milk out of a milk carton. So it's roughly homogenous. But if you zoom in enough, you can see the difference. Probably could do it with a visible microscope. You probably don't even need to get past what you could get with a microscope from the bio lab. You could probably see the difference. See the boundaries between little fat droplets and the water. Um, so again, you need to know these terms. I'm not, it's not always a black and white, it's one or the other. It depends on how you define it and how you explain your logic. Make sense? I mean, as clear as mud, right? Clear as milk. Ah. Um, so this is, like I said, this is a, um, you could think of this as a flow chart. Oh, mayonnaise is a good one. I heard somebody, somebody say mayonnaise. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is a mixture. It's roughly homogenous. It's got the same problem as milk, though. If you zoom in far enough. Um, but it is a mixture. Anybody know how to make mayonnaise? Eggs. Um, I don't think it's milk. I think it's mostly just fat. It's eggs and, and oil. Um, depends on which kind of mayo you want to make. If you want to get fancy, you call it naoli, and then you can use any kind of oil you want. All right. So this is, again, just a way of thinking about things. Everything is matter, right? So then this question is, are the properties and composition constant? In other words, is it always the same ratio of atoms? If your answer is yes, it's a pure substance. If your answer is no, it's a mixture. And then within mixture, you can say, okay, well, is it homogenous or heterogeneous? Can I, is the top of the sample always the same as the bottom of the sample? If yes, then that's homogenous. If no, it's heterogeneous. Um, if it's a pure substance, can you further simplify it into just one type of atom? If you, if it's, in other words, this is another way of saying, is it already all one element, or is it a mixture of elements that are always combined in the same ratio? That's how we differentiate between compounds versus elements. Right? And, and this also brings up the next, the next thing I want to talk about real quick which is the idea of what type of change is. We talked about chemical property versus physical property. I said that that's really dumb. I don't think I said it quite that bluntly, but I don't like that distinction because there's a lot of gray area. Every physical property is a chemical property if you zoom in far enough. Um, change has a similar issue. Physical change versus chemical change. A physical change means that all of your substances, all of your compounds are still the same compound before and after something happens. Right, so and if you're just changing the shape of something, like if, for instance, you can take gold and literally if you just take a, a gold ingot and you just hammer it, you can literally hammer it until into gold foil. It's still gold before and after though. So that's a physical change. Taking something and changing its shape is always a physical change. Changing its phase is a physical change because it doesn't matter if it's ice or if it's liquid water or if it's steam, it's still H2O, right? It's still water. And usually these physical changes are relatively easy to reverse. Like adding salt to water to make salt water, 
you can then separate those back out without too much trouble, right? And you still get the salt and, you, and water at the end. Chemical changes are defined as when a substance changes identity or molecular structure, or in other words, when your compound is not the same compound at the end as it was when you started. So for instance, going from glucose to fructose, the same, same formula, they're both C6H12O2, but we can change how the atoms are connected to each other. If you're changing how the atoms are connected to each other, that's a chemical change. Um, that usually means new chemical, new chemical and new physical properties. A color change is usually a dead giveaway. If something changes color, it's almost always a chemical change. Um, they tend to be harder to reverse. For instance, most time you think of cooking, anytime you're cooking something, that's almost always a chemical change. I say that, but the example I used of cooking earlier, of cooking pasta, that's less of, it's kind of a chemical change, but then you can take cooked pasta and you can dry it back out and get dried pasta back out of it. Um, dry, salty pasta. Yeah. Um, so is a little bit tricky, but you can't uncook a flan, right? Or like once you cook an egg, an egg stays cooked. There's no uncooking an egg. So it sounds dumb to even say, right? That's an example of a chemical change. If it's something we're like, well, yeah, obviously you can't do that. You can't go backwards. Um, that's usually a chemical change. Um, so iron rusting is another example. There's a lot of key keywords that kind of tell you uh, that clues anytime it's a phase change word it's a physical change if it's a mixing word um it's a physical change if anytime you hear oxidizes rusts um burns anything like that is going to be a chemical change so let's let's look at some examples i put cutting a pizza at First one, but let's leave that till the end. Dissolving sugar in water. Physical. It's a mixture, right? Dissolving. Sorry, did you have a question? Okay, sorry. Cut that man. Um, how about iron rusting in an old car? Chemical, not easy to go back, right? You can dent a, a car's bumper. Let's say we're talking about an old car that's actually all metal rather than plastic, because that confuses things. If you dent a metal quarter panel on a car, it's pretty easy to undent it usually, right? With the right tools, you just, you know, hit it right. And it goes back to the other shape. That's a physical change. It's a lot harder to rehab a car that's rusted out. Because that's a chemical change. Can you untoast a marshmallow? So that makes it chemical. Can you unmelt ice? Yeah. <laughs> Ice melts and then it refreezes all winter, right? Yeah. So that's a physical change. And that's a phase change keyword, right? Melting, freezing, um, evaporating, condensing. Those are all phase change keywords. But dry ice, it is, it's, we'll, we'll define what that term is. It doesn't really melt though, per se, right? Has anybody played around with dry ice before? Uh, you shouldn't because it's very dangerous. I definitely didn't do that when I was in high school. Um, so dry ice, it's we call it sublimates or sublimes. It goes straight from a solid to a gas at atmospheric pressure, which means it's, it's not really melting, but it's still a physical change. You're still getting CO2 out of it. It starts as solid CO2 and then you get gas CO2, but it's still just CO2. Propane burning. Can you reuse the propane when you're done with it? No, it's CO2 and, and water when you're done with it. What about candle? Burning a candle. It depends. There's a physical change to go along with a chemical change, right? The wick burns, and some of the wax burns with the wick, but some of it also melts. The part that's melting, that's a physical change. But the part that's burning, that's a chemical change. And last but not least, cutting a pizza. 
It's pizza before and after, right? But can you uncut pizza? I, I don't know. Maybe you could try and recook it. So that's that's a tricky one because gluten that you make, it would be easier to do it if it was a gluten-free pizza um, to put it back together. Because, but actually, a lot of the things you when you make a dough. You're actually taking and letting all the proteins that are already present in whatever that grain is or whatever that you're using, you're letting those proteins interact together and they tend to make these really long chains of proteins. That's what gluten is, is specifically if you use wheat flour, you make gluten. Um, other grains that aren't wheat make a protein that's almost the same as gluten. So when somebody says they're gluten free, but they eat, you know, um, you know barley. And instead of wheat, they I, I won't eat wheat, I'm gluten free, but I'll eat, you know, doughs made with barley or rye or other grains, farro. Um, those still make similar proteins, they're just not named gluten. Um, so they can technically be gluten free and still make a bread that's just like wheat bread. Um, it just looks a little bit different. But anyway, um, when you make those big long gluten molecules or whatever you're using, when you cut the pizza, you're literally using physical force to break chemical bonds. So it's one of those where it's, that's a tricky one. Depends on how you define things. If you say it's a chemical change because you're breaking apart gluten molecules there and you can't put them back together, that's the right answer. If you say it's a physical change because it's pizza before and it's pizza after, it doesn't matter to, you can't taste the difference if you eat it all as one piece or if you eat it cut into slices. It's the same pizza, right? It depends on what scale we're looking at things, right? So again, I don't always like questions like these, but I want you to have seen them because lots of other science classes use the term physical change or chemical change. Just know that there's a lot of wiggle room as long as you define your terms and explain your logic. Does that make sense? Clear as milk again, huh? Yeah. What's the difference between barley? What's like? I don't actually know if they're two separate species, so I shouldn't use that as an example. It's my default because I also used to brew beer a lot and you use barley for beer, but you don't use wheat for beer typically. But I don't know if they're separate species or not yet. Um, corn would have been a better example. Corn's a separate species than wheat. Um, but barley is also a grain that's really, really similar to wheat. Um, if it's not the same species, it's very close. So, so like cornbread. So in theory you could make a gluten-free cornbread but you probably can't make a gluten-free barley bread because the proteins in barley are too close to the proteins in wheat and so you probably are making the same thing yeah i mean not not a lot of digestible dietary protein not that we can absorb but that's every every living thing everything you eat has protein and it just might not be what we think of as being protein rich they both, have they both have protein, but they're different proteins, which means you can say one's gluten-free, one's not, even though they're they have molecules that are pretty much the same property. So is there such thing? Yes, there are. There is such thing as gluten-free, mostly for people with celiac disease that actually have not just like you know gluten makes my tummy hurt a little bit, but people that have like a real allergy. So they can eat cornbread. They might be able to eat cornbread, but they probably couldn't eat eat something made from barley or rye because they're close, too close to wheat. Just like you can be allergic to bumblebees, but not be allergic to yellow jackets. Right? Yeah. All right. We got, what, 12 minutes left? That went fast, didn't it? <laughs> Talking about bread? Um, so we, we ended on Friday talking about how how Kinetic energy at the molecular level was temperature, right? We Vibrations in molecules, molecules running and bouncing into things, that's what we perceive as temperature. Um, potential energy at the molecular level, I said it verbally, but it's um, I didn't have a slide ready for it at the time, is the potential energy is the energy stored in chemical bonds. So when I, in, it's a little bit like storing energy in a spring. If you think about, um, a Nerf gun, 
a Nerf blaster that has what well, you have to pull it back to, to prime a spring and then it stores that primed energy as a, as a spring energy. And then when you release it, it all explodes out, right? Chemical bonds are a lot like that. They take energy to, or they, they form because they're more stable than not forming. But a lot of times there's a more stable form. And if you, if you pull the trigger and break those bonds in the, form, in the presence of oxygen, you can get more stable bonds to form. And when you go downhill in energy to make something more stable, that energy gets released to the surroundings. And so that potential energy is being released in the form of heat when you break those chemical bonds. And so if you get really clever with how we arrange things, we can use that to do work. The, most, the easiest way to think about that is you just sped up the molecules around it. You released heat and stuff got hotter. But if you're really clever, we can actually kind of harness that. That's all an internal combustion engine is, is you're making gasoline explode with oxygen and you're just capturing that explosion to move a piston. And that piston's attached to your drive shaft. Your drive shaft turns your wheel, right? So turning chemical potential energy into either molecular kinetic energy, if we're just making things hot, or, um, macroscopic kinetic energy, or sometimes even macroscopic potential energy. You could, you could use chemical potential energy to move a car's wheels that push the car uphill. Hill. Now the car has potential energy in the form of um, it's higher in altitude and it could fall back down, but you change the form from one type of energy to another, right? And so we're gonna talk a lot about temperature change, because that's the most obvious way to judge whether or not a chemical um, change has happened or a physical change is a lot of times we can look, if we, if we watch something happen and there's a color change and a temperature change, it's almost always a chemical reaction that happens. If we just mix some things together and we just get salt water, that's a physical change. So uh, this is a good thing to we will not start doing calculations yet. We'll talk about the calculations on Wednesday um, so that you're ready for the lab procedure on Thursday. What you're going to do for your lab this week is, is basically you're gonna heat something up to a known temperature and then you're gonna add it to some water and you're gonna watch how the temperature changes. So if you have a piece of hot metal that's you know say 100 Celsius and you add it to room temperature water, watch the water's temperature rise, we can actually calculate how much energy changed hands. Not all that exciting of a lab. It's literally what you think. It's watching water boil and then watching water cool down. Um, but the difference is we can actually do some math with it. And the math is what makes it a little more interesting and what's gonna allow us to do this down the road because then we get to do fun stuff like the same reaction that you get from instant ice packs. And we can do that in a coffee cup, watch the temperature change and measure the mass of the water. And we can figure out how much energy was released by that chemical reaction, which is kind of cool. We get to do cooler stuff once we lay the groundwork with some really boring-ish labs. Um, but before we can do that, we need units because we can't do any calculations without units. We can say something got hotter or colder, but that's not... That's not good enough really for us in chemistry and sciences. We want numbers, right? We want to know how much hotter, how much colder. Um, so the two primary units that most things are based on in the sciences are joules and calories. Um, and calories are kind of make more sense what they're talking about, but a joule is the physics unit because it's easy to derive from the basics um, principles in physics. Calorie was defined by a chemist in the 1800s, no, 1700s. Um, and it's defined as how much energy do you have to put in to walk to one gram of water to raise it one degree Celsius? Doesn't seem like very much energy, right? Can everybody visualize one gram of water? What does one gram of water look like? Not very much. It's one milliliter is one gram roughly. So one milliliter of water by one degree Celsius, not very much. So why do we think of calories like, so 2000 calories is all we need to eat in a day, just enough to raise, with, that's only 200 
uh, two kilograms, one degree Celsius. Is that all we burn in a day? No. Um, if you actually look really carefully, chemistry is really annoying in the sense that um, capitalization matters. If you look on your nutritional facts, calories is with a capital C, which means it's actually a kilocalorie or a thousand regular calories. So a nutritional calorie with a capital C is actually a thousand times is enough to raise one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. Right. And so and if you go to other countries, they're actually better about their units um, that will actually say kcal for kilocalorie on the nutritional facts. But because Americans think they're allergic to the metric system, they don't want to put kilo on on a nutritional label. So they just made a capital C instead of a lowercase c. Right? It should have been so easy. Um, but just some other, if you go into other fields, there are other units out there. If you go into mechanical engineering, you get BTUs. That's how they rate furnaces, right? BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. It's literally a measure of how much heat a furnace can put out per hour. Um, if you look at, if you go to physics or electrical engineering, they do a lot with EV, lowercase e for electron, uppercase v for volt. It's the energy that you get when you allow one electron to fall down um, one volt of potential. Um, firms, they actually sell you natural gas. If you have a, have a gas bill, if you look at it, a lot of times it'll be rated in time, how many therms did you burn? Which has to do with how many cubic feet of natural gas did you burn over the course of a month? <laughs> Um, because because we rate it in terms of a volume, this is a gas, and so we we say at right, the specific pressure, here's how many cubic feet this gas would occupy, and then if you burn it, you get it certain. You can convert between therms and BTUs once it hits your furnace, but they're really both energy units. The last two, just because they're super fun, kilowatt hours is how you do your electric bill is kilowatt hours. Doesn't sound like it makes that much sense, but if you take physics, you can derive what a kilowatt hour is. Watt is a unit of power, but you need, but that means it's energy per time. So if you wanna turn a power into an energy, you actually have to multiply by a time unit. So you get kilowatt hours. Um, barrel of oil equivalent. That's an energy term. It literally is the amount of energy that you get by taking 55 gallons of crude oil and turning it into gasoline and burning it. Um, and last but not least, tons of TNT is actually an energy unit. You could tons, a ton, it's a metric ton, so it's a thousand kilograms. But if you ever heard about a bomb being a 15 kiloton bomb, that means that that bomb is the equivalent. I, be, I believe that um, the bomb that exploded over Hiroshima was a 15 kiloton bomb. It was the equivalent of detonating 15,000 kilograms of TNT all at once. Um, that's an energy unit too. We're mostly going to stick with kilojoules and calories because that's the scale we work in. But anything that re that relates to um, electricity, power, movement can be turned into energy units. And uh, one more point. We're going to do, we're actually going to mostly deal with kilojoules rather than just joules because kilojoules is more of a scale we're looking at. Joules and calories are close enough to the same size. A joule is a meter. So it's a, it's a Newton, Newtons times seconds, I believe, which winds up turning into kilograms times meters per second squared, meters squared over second squared, which Again, it's a physics thing. The reason they define it that way, calories kind of makes more sense for chemists, but kilojoules is the standard, or joules is the standard. So we will always go back to joules. But it's a really straightforward conversion. One calorie equals 4.184 joules. All right, any last minute questions? I know I have like 30 seconds left, I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> We won't be able to get that close, but if you take my, if you take a, if you major in chemistry, the third third year class, if you take physical chemistry, it's literally how physics turns into chemistry. 
Um, so I'll talk about it to some extent, um, but then, um, but it's not going to feel just because you took physics, it's not going to necessarily make chemistry make more sense other than you know what a gene is. Um, yeah. Okay. On Thursday to Monday. Yeah. Let me, I don't, would assume I can sign this. I've never had to sign these okay. things before, but it's just like what my grade is in the class. Okay. What work I should complete. Uh, I mean, at this point, everybody's still got an A. Um, so net, and this is for, you said till Tuesday? Thursday Friday. to Monday. Thursday to Monday. So you're going to miss Thursday's Thursday, lab? Friday okay. And Monday. Um, so on Tuesday, you can do the same lab that everybody's going to do. Okay. It's an easy enough one to make up. All right. Um, so you don't need to do it while you're gone. So just do the quiz. Okay. Um, and, uh, and watch the lecture from okay. 